I don't know that anybody knows the particulars in Oregon, but that historically uh, the one constant threat has been uh, people suffering from some degree of mental illness. It's just beyond my comprehension that we are seeing these mass murders happen again and again and again. And as I have said, we have got to get the political will to do everything we can to keep people safe. You know, I know there is a way to have sensible gun control measures that help prevent violence, prevent guns from getting into the wrong hands, and save lives. You have very strong laws on the books, but you're always going to have problems. I mean, we have millions and millions of people. We have millions of sick people all over the world. I always find it interesting that the reflexive reaction of the left is to say we need more gun laws. Criminals don't follow gun laws. Only law-abiding people follow gun laws. And there's just no evidence that these gun laws would prevent these shootings, but it would prevent law-abiding people from being able to defend themselves. One of the first things I think we can do is prosecute those folks who have guns and are not supposed to have guns. So before we start calling for more laws, I think we ought to consider why we don't um, enforce the laws we have. I found the president's comments last night um, premature at best and uh, at worst a um, really unfortunate politicization of this tragedy. What stopped that shooter in Oregon yesterday? What stopped him? He was continuing to shoot. What stopped him? It was a police officer with what? A conversation? A, a reading from a book? It was a cop with a gun that stopped him. We're in a difficult time in our country, and I don't think uh, more government is necessarily the answer to this. I think we need to reconnect ourselves um, with everybody else. It's just, it's, it's very sad to see. But I, I resist the notion, and I did, I, ha I had this, this challenge as governor, because we had, look, stuff happens, there's always a crisis, and the impulse is always to do something, and it's not necessarily the right thing to do. You said that sometimes stuff happens and that there's an impulse to do something that yeah, maybe... not related not to Oregon. Just right, for the just clarity here, let's make sure that we don't allow this to get out of control. Sometimes you're, you're imposing uh, solutions to problems that doesn't fix the problem and, and takes away people's liberty and rights, and that's the point I was trying to make. Was stuff happens a, a mistake then? In the second no, session, it wasn't a mistake. I said exactly what I said. I, what, why would you t explain to me what I said wrong? We should stuff happen. Things happen yeah. all the time. Things. Is that better? You know, it's, an, it's become theology for the Republican Party to not even consider any element of gun safety or gun control legislation. It's become reflexive. And that's partly because they have watched their base move so far to the right. And I think it did begin, as Bob points out, in the early 90s, and all these conspiracy theories about, about either Clinton, now Obama, taking away their guns and black helicopters. And the Republicans have exploited that paranoia, first with Clinton, now with Obama. And they're in a point where they feel they can't even have a conversation about it. Today, John Kasich, up in New Hampshire, campaigning, told one of my reporters from Mother Jones, when asked what to do about this, he said, I think we need more of the death penalty. What? Most of these shooters end up killing themselves or end up being shot right. by the cops. So it makes absolutely no sense. They have nothing to say. And that's why I think Bush made the, you know, basically told us what they really think. This is the price of doing business. Stuff happens. Get used to it. This is a society we live in. We have no piece of productive advice on what to do about it. We've got a human behavior problem. We've got a problem with uncivilized savages. I don't believe that gun control would stop this. I think they have very tough gun laws in that state. You're not going to handle it with more gun control because gun control only works for normal law-abiding citizens. It doesn't work for crazy. And I will politicize it because our inaction is a political decision that we are making. We got to make a decision. If, if we think that's normal, then we, we have to own it. I don't think it's normal. What do you think of this argument, Brian, that basically there is nothing you can do? This sort of, look, there's terrible things that happen in the world, and this is one of those things that is a terrible thing that you can't do anything about. That is more or less my stance, actually, and I'm glad you used the term honesty, because I think President Obama last night, in, in trying to, to use his bully pulpit to, to get across a national sense of sorrow, which is the right thing to do, he made implied promises about what politics could do that we now know are not true. Uh, you'll note last night, at least, he didn't say anything specific about the common sense gun safety laws that he thinks could prevent tragedies like this. And we learned today 
uh, that the guy was able to buy all those guns legally. He did not have anything in his background that would have prevented him from legally owning them. And every horrible, monstrous mass killer, before they actually start using the gun, has been a law-abiding citizen. So the only kind of laws that actually would have stopped things like this are, A, laws that actually somehow made every gun in the United States disappear, which I don't think is either possible or constitutional, or two, some sort of minority uh, report type thing where if we know in the future you're going to do right. something horrible, we stop you. So it actually is honest to say there wasn't anything the laws could do. But here's and the thing, I right? don't think Obama proved different. Okay, so 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 we got to we got to when we talk about these conversations, right? There's mass shootings, there's gun violence in general, right? So as just to, to lay the empirical groundwork here, right? The U.S. is an uncommonly violent place compared to other uh, countries of uh, similar uh, wealth, development-wise. It has way more gun deaths. Way, 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 way. That's us, by the way, on the top of that line. Way, way, way more gun deaths per 100,000. So these are just the facts about America, right? It also has way, 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 way more guns. I mean, it has more per capita guns than basically anywhere in the world, Yemen and Iraq, right? So the, the question then becomes, is that, a, is that a problem we want to deal with? I mean, that to me is a real question, right? Like, we lose 30,000 people a year in this country to gun deaths. 10,000 of those are homicide, roughly 20,000 suicide. And the question on the table, I think, really at the root of it is, is that a thing we shrug our shoulders at? Or, is that, or do we see that as a policy problem that we actually want to fight? And I think people like yourself and the Republican candidates say it's just not a policy problem. It is the price of freedom. To a certain extent, that's true. I mean, of course, we do not want to see a world where lots of people are getting killed by guns. And it's interesting to look at the overall correlation. We've got lots of guns. We've got lots of gun violence. But if you look at the time series, as I know you know, as there have been more guns in America over the course of the last 20 years, up until the most recent FBI crime reports, the actual murders and crimes committed with guns are going down. So there's no necessary all crime correlation. Is right. There's all, crime go the all right. crimes going down in that period, right. just to be clear. Right. right. Yeah. Clearly, there is something that happens in America with respect to gun violence that is exceptional. Yeah. I mean, it is empirically sure. an exceptional nation vis-a-vis -vis gun ownership and gun violence. And I think if people want to make the argument that we should, we should embrace that exceptionalism, we have a Second Amendment, and we are exceptional, we are exceptional in gun ownership, exceptional in gun pride, and exceptional in gun deaths, then make that argument. But, but, but that is the argument, isn't it? Well, it is not embracing it to state that there is no conceivable public policy solution that actually would stop it. That's not the same as shrugging your shoulders and saying, this is great, or shrugging your shoulders and saying, oh, I, 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 I wish this would just go on. But it, it's worth, when you're talking about in political terms, it's worth actually acknowledging what could we do politically to right. stop it. There's another thing, Chris, that we have to address, and that is, and it was sort of mentioned uh, by, by uh, Secretary Clinton when she spoke, is this culture of paranoia that the National Rifle Association inculcates in its members. Uh, when the president in 2013 signed his executive orders, we didn't hear from the political right that he, they disagreed with right, his, right. Uh, the substance of his, of his executive orders. We didn't even hear really that he'd quote unquote overstepped his constitutional bounds. We heard fascist, we heard tyranny, we heard Steve Stockman, a congressman from Texas, call for impeachment. You know, and we've got a, a whole bunch of people in this country who have been convinced that the president who has done very little on gun control is going to kick down right. their doors. Now I keep hearing all the time about the, the responsible American gun owners. Well, if there are that many of them, it's time for them to take their movement back. All right, Charlie Pierce, thank you very much.